right, gang, and what the, welcome, <laughs> welcome to episode 34 for the Beauville in Newtown for 2022. Happens to be Saturday, September the 3rd. And um, I know a lot of you saw the mail call that I got last week. Um, obviously, it raised some questions, I know. Um, I'll start with the track. Um, actually, I'm going to start with the Quick Connects first. Um, those things are absolutely wonderful. If you're going to do what I'm doing here, which is using multiple cameras, multiple pieces of equipment, uh, however you want to look at it. Um, being able to interchange them between different tripods or different setups, having the Quick Connects is an absolute must. Um, obviously, with the way that I'm doing things, I'm doing things a little bit differently because of the fact that I've got the main tripod, which is on wheels, for doing my... Uh, vlog recordings or my episode recordings. When I go over to the other tripod, which sh uh, drops down a lot further than what this one will now because of the way I have it set up, um, I use that one for doing the shorts that usually come out once a week. I haven't put one out yet this week. I'll probably do that tomorrow. Uh, that would be Sunday. So by the time this video gets out, it'll already have done past. Um, it's one of those things I decided to give a shot to, um, just doing the shorts, um, because I want to show some trains running. Well, when I'm doing the episodes, I really don't have time to do that because I'm doing, a, I'm going to be doing a lot more explaining of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it and the way I'm doing it. Um, you know, if you all follow, those of who have followed me for a while, Know that I do things outside the box. I, I try to do things um, on a very tight budget. Um, you know, I we just got the house a couple years ago. A lot of what's on this railroad has been recycled from the old layout or the old older layouts, as the case were. So, you know, I'm doing a lot of that. Number one. Number two, somebody had asked me about the phone. You know, why do you use white foam? Well, white foam is cheap. And also, when you buy something, usually it's packed in white foam. So I have been using it to, but for the, for, I've been using it a long time, and I haven't had issues with it. Granted, if you're looking for something that's going to be, that's going to leave you a smoother base, then you want to go with the blue or the pink foam. That's fine. If you want to do things on, on, on a budget, the white foam will just work just fine. It does have its inherent issues. Uh, you cannot cut it with a hot knife. You have to cut it by hand um, because of the fact that most of the stuff that comes in packing material has got chemicals in it, and you don't want to be breathing that stuff. So that's one drawback. I don't have a hot knife, so I don't worry about it. Everything I've done cut on here was done cut with either a sheetrock knife, uh, an X-Acto knife, or, um, as you saw when I was working down in Beauville, even a long butcher knife. So, it'll work just fine. You just have to be aware of the inherent issues of working with the white foam. Um, but like I was saying, I do things on a budget. And... You know, all of the locomotives and most of the rolling stock have not been bought brand new. Everything has been bought secondhand. Uh, some of it was hand-me-downs. There is some stuff on here that was bought, um, you know, in the box, whatever. It might be new old stock, but it was either stuff that I bought while I was in the service or it was stuff that I bought uh, a few years ago when I had the old 13-foot uh, by 11-foot layout and I lived over in my other house. There's three locomotives that I bought that are brand new. And that's one of the things that's going to be coming uh, because it was asked about on Sidetrack Sunday a while back was doing another locomotive roster update because, <laughs> and here we go, I have a lot of locomotives and I have a lot of rolling stock. That's the reason why I wanted to build the monster that I've got. I wanted something that I'd be able to use everything that I've got. Um... 
But as I was saying, I've got three locomotives, the Delaware and Hudson, the Seaboard, and the Richmond, Fredericks, Fredericksburg, and Potomac. Those three locomotives are only, I'm going to say at most, maybe 10 years old. They're probably a little bit newer than that. Uh, those were actually were all DCC locomotives that I pulled the boards out of and made them straight DC. Um, and of course, I've just made everybody in the DCC world cringe. Because when I bought those locomotives, I believe those older boards, they were not compatible with DC. That's the reason why I pulled them out. The newer boards, I think you can, in fact, we had the, you know, the 611, which is a DCC locomotive, but it will work on a DC layout. Anyway, um, I basically... You know, the other last week, Heath had mentioned that he's got some old brass track that he wants to get rid of. To which I said, hey, if you want to get rid of it, I'll take it. There's people out there that say, you don't want to touch brass. You, do, you want to stay away from brass. It's just like everything else, folks. If you take care of it, it does require a little bit more maintenance. I'll give it that. You've got to stay on top of it. Um... You know, with what we found earlier this year or late last year, whatever it was, with the mineral spirits, to be honest, I mean, even my buddy Big John, when he was over here the other week, I told him, I said, run your fingers across the track. Whoops. And he's like, there's there's no marks. I said, exactly. I said, and it's, I haven't touched it since I ran the mineral spirits across it the last time. And it's been almost, in fact, I think it's been over a year. Now, granted, I haven't been running the railroad as much as I'd like to, and I probably do need to start running it a little bit more, but I'm very happy with what happened or how that mineral spirits has worked versus using uh, the isopropyl alcohol or the IPA, either be 70 or 91%. That's a different topic for a different time, but again, if you maintain it, it'll be fine. Um, any rate... One of the questions that came up is, why did you want switch machines? <laughs> well, as you all know, and of course, if you notice, we're behind the layout. Um, one of the things that I ran across, and I'm just going to pan down here a second. One of the things that I noticed is the fact that I have one, two, three, four switches back here in the hidden yards that do not have switch machines. Now, first thing is, why are you worried? Why, why do you want to use snap switches? Why don't you just go ahead and put in switch machines? Good point. Very good point. First thing is, there is going to be absolutely no scenery back here whatsoever. These are not going to be wired switches. These are going to be manual switches. Um, these are going to be manual switches, so I don't have to worry about running electrical to them. Um... I just need something to hold the switch in place while I'm doing the maneuvers that we're going to be doing back here. Why is there going to be maneuvers? Well, if you actually look over here at the North Yard, Harrisburg, you'll see that we've got the Wabash is the next outgoing passenger train, and the next outgoing freight train is going to be the Baltimore and Ohio GP20. Well, the freight cars are on track three, and it's actually got one behind it on track four. If in a normal operating session, you are running the southbound local, which is what that is, you're going to have to pull the train out. The yardmaster is going to have to flip the switch. You're going to have to back up, pick up the rest of the train before you can go out. Now, because these switches do not have switch machines on them, they're inherently going to want to move. That's going to cause a derailment. I don't want derailments. So, what's the fix? The fix is to go ahead and take some of these switch machines off of the switches, or the turnouts, that Grandpa Rail sent me. And now I can go ahead and I can put switch machines on here to keep these switches from changing direction in the middle of a move. Now, one of the things that Jason had brought up and a while back, because I had mentioned wanting to use manual throws in Beauville Yard, because it's a yard. He brought up a good point. Do you really want somebody sticking their hand into a completed scene to, to flip a turnout? Great point. 
completely understood. That yard, I'm not certain how much scenery is actually going to be in that yard. That's the first thing. The second thing is, it's a yard. Every time you make a move, you're going to have to flip a switch. It takes time to flip the switches manually versus going over and hitting a button and watching the thing, the thing swing. So, that adds time. If you notice, you know, if you're, if you're actually running operations, things can move fairly quickly. Well, if you're having to go in there and move or change turnout positions constantly, it's taking time. It's going to take you longer to make the moves than what it would if you're just pushing the button. Now, with that being said, there is one switch or one turnout and that's the one that's actually over here by Harrisburg Yard. But that one is for RBC distribution, which comes through the backdrop. That's a hidden turnout. The person that's running the local, and eventually I'll get to this again. I think I've already gone over it a couple of times. But the person that's running that local has control over that turnout. What the, uh, the North Yard Master is going to be in charge of, though, is letting that person know when their train has gotten to the point of being able to release the cars that it's dropping off and being able to pull back forward to pick up the outgoing cars. If you notice, there are two tracks here. Like I said, there is a turnout. It's a hidden turnout. That one is electrical because you can't see it. So, and there's one other issue with this whole, this whole track back here, and eventually I'm going to fix it. And that's the fact that there's way too much of a hump coming off the main line and into here. I'm actually thinking of raising that section up a little bit. It's going to actually do two things for me. One, it's going to get these cars away from the inbound uh, northbound train, which comes in on this track here. If you notice, it's really, really tight back here, and people with sausage fingers are going to have a problem pulling cars out of there. That's, that was a design flaw. That was a, that was a miss. Whatever you want to call it, I'll fix it. Well, I'm not going to be able to fix it, but I'm going to try and make it a little bit better. But anyway, so my project for right now is going to be putting in some switch machines to go ahead and hold these switches in place and... Uh, We'll be back. Well, <laughs> I got them in. Um, I actually had to, on the uh, Richmond yard, I actually had to pull the switches out to get the, the uh, hardware to, to line up right. I did get the ones on uh, the Harrisburg side done without having to rip up the track. So I now have manual switch machines back here. Uh, so it was one, two, three, four. So now they're they're all they're all straight. So now I can I feel comfortable now backing a train through the through these uh, turnouts, and uh, we'll see how that works at some point in the future. All right. Sometimes you have to create a mess to fix a mess. I guess that's the best way to put it. Um, Sorry if the camera shakes, I'm turning the viewfinder so I can actually see what's going on back here. Um, I decided after last night talking about the uh, RBC distribution that goes through the backdrop here uh, into Harrisburg Yard, even though it's not a part of the yard, it's actually separated. Um, there was, let me see if I can pan down enough here, there we go. There was a heck of a bump coming off of the crossover here, going into uh, that, in, that industrial spur. Uh, upon further review, um, I decided it would be best just to not so much reconfigure it, but as I was stating last night, um, one of the issues was the fact that it was just, there was just way too much of a an incline there. I'm trying to get this track back where it belongs. I can actually see if I got this right, which it looks like I do. Um, so I've made that adjustment 
and I found a piece of white foam that will bring it up to the correct level. Now what I've done here is the outside edge here, what the main lines sit on, I believe is half inch. I should have measured it, and I didn't. And I'm not even sure if I've got my <laughs> tape measure. Oh yeah, I've got it handy. Um, yeah, the things of doing recordings, you know. Um, actually, this is closer to three quarters of an inch. Um, so what I did is I found another piece of three quarter inch foam. I put in a um, a wedge and a spacer here to go ahead and get it up to the foam core or the foam level, the the um, foam roadbed level. And I had to. <laughs> Like I said, I had to actually go into my stockpile and find a piece of sheet foam that was actually thin enough to make this area here, back here, uh, come up to the right height so that there wouldn't be a bump back here, which I found, and I've already cut one piece of it. I need to cut another piece because this, this spur is fairly long. It's uh, long enough to hold six cars normally, three 40-foot boxcars, and three... Uh, mechanical reefers or actually not uh, ice bunker reefers not mechanicals although it could handle mechanicals too um, so why am I even bothering with bothering with this right now well because the locals or the local the, the southbound local is the next thing out um, and <laughs> I might as well go ahead and reconfigure this and get it right and test it to make sure it's going to work so that's what I'm in the process of doing right now. So I'm going to go ahead and go on the back side into Harrisburg Yard. And I'm going to cut myself another piece of foam to finish this piece out. I'm going to go get my foam-friendly adhesive, or caulk, and I'm going to caulk the whole thing down. And I'm, well, before I even do that, I've got to vacuum up this mess because I've created one mel of a hess back here. Um, so we'll get that cleaned up, and then we'll get it... Uh, glued in and then I'll be able to relay the track and then we'll be able to test it and see if it's actually going to work now I've actually got box cars and refrigerator cars sitting out here on the main line that were actually back there uh, so those will be the first ones in and we'll see how well this works so stick around <laughs> let's see if I actually get this fixed okay so that took a little bit more than I expected of course it always does but uh, what I ended up doing while I was at it was uh, replacing every one of the rail joints back there too just to make sure that everything lined up, was set, so on and so forth um, because of where it sits, it's going to be a pain once I do other stuff back here uh, to be able to get to it. So the, uh, the whole thing from that crossover all the way back there um, has been replaced um, well not replaced but relayed um, I've already put the six cars that were already in RBC distribution back where they were um, so it's now set up for the next uh, southbound freight run that would uh, pick those cars up and take them down to Beauville Yard so we'll see if my reconfiguration of this works out better than what I had and I I'm fairly confident that it's going to fix the issues that I was having um, because I've already run these cars across the crossover a couple times I was having issues with them uncoupling because there was such a, um, a steep ch change in grade I guess is the best way to put it the other thing I noticed as I was uh, going to put a wedge back up underneath of this um, it's probably not a good, good idea to have a, uh, a, a, um, a grade on a curve, especially a hidden curve. <laughs> so what I did instead is I just went ahead and braced up down here. I just went, sorry for the quick movement. I just went and braced up back here. So I, it's actually on the straight section that now goes from mainline level down to siding level. Um, I think that's going to work out better. So when I actually get to running a train, which is going to be a bit because I've got some cleanup to do, but when I get to running a train, we'll see how well this works. 
So we'll be back as soon as I figure out what I just did with the remote for the camera. Well, folks, today, or tonight, whatever, um, I'm going to try to fix this thing. Um, I was just I, I was just watching one of uh, Ron's uh, videos from Classic Model Trains. Um, not that he's worked on one of these, but this thing has been a thorn in my backside since the day I bought it. Um, not the shell. The shell actually is a dummy shell. It actually came from someplace else. Um, but the the mechanism that I bought second hand has just been ridiculous. Um, that was full power and I had to push it to get it started. It'll run halfway decent in one direction. Now back here it seems to run fine, which is which makes no sense. Well, yeah, that, there we go, it's stuttering. And I'm having to give it full power to get it to do anything. Um, and I've got another one that came from life, like this is an Atherin Blue Box. But I've got the Great Northern that I bought, that is a, uh, uh, that's a Proto 2000, that's a lifelike one. This one here is an Atherin. But this thing, I have no idea. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it apart and see what's going on with it. Um, if I find something, I will let you know. Well, this is almost slightly embarrassing. <laughs> Just slightly. Um, I thought that I had uh, done maintenance on this locomotive not that long ago. I mean, really deep maintenance on it. But apparently, uh, something that was lacking was uh, <laughs> the wheels getting cleaned. Uh, so, <laughs> needless to say, what's happened is, is I went through and just cleaned the wheels off, and well, gee, voila, uh, it's, it's running a lot better. I'm not sure if it's running the way it's supposed to yet or not, because I, this is a very weak power pack back here. It's mainly just done for testing. Um, but I can tell you before where I was having to hit it with 100% power, I was about 50 to 75%. So that's actually a decent sign. So we're going to take it out to the layout and see what happens. Uh, at 75% power, I think I fixed it. Well, Trek Gang, I started recording this over a week ago. <laughs> and to be honest, I have no idea what's on here. So I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, one thing I want to note is the fact that I have Sidetrack Sunday uh, this coming weekend. Um, that is going to be, uh, yeah, the 18th of September uh, 2022, uh, 8 p.m., my channel. So we'll catch you all there, and you all know the deal. Wait for the high ball. Green tracks ahead. We'll catch you all next time. Be safe. God bless. We will see you.